Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is a review and a rant on the 2021 comedy sequel, Coming to America. This was a sequel that was years in the making, and sadly, just like many other belated sequels to classic films or classic comedies it was pretty bad and initially i wasn't too hard on it i still thought it was average i thought it was okay when uh i was done watching it when it comes to my initial thoughts but then I slept on it, then I thought about it some more, and what immediately popped in, into my head was how forgettable the film was, which is never a good thing. And the other thing that popped in was there wasn't a single joke or a single gag or a single moment when it comes to the comedy that I wanted to watch again, or really made me laugh as hard as the first film. So, yeah, it's just one of those films where once the, the rush of nostalgia wore off of seeing Eddie Murphy playing Akeem again and seeing uh, Arsenio Hall in a film playing his character Semi and seeing James Earl Jones as King Joffe and, and Sherry Headley as Lisa, once all of that wore off... I really quickly realized that I wasn't really a fan of the film. And that sucks because there is a potentially interesting or enjoyable idea with this sequel, but it's so half-assed. It's so lazy that it never really lives up to its potential and it wastes the performances and the best effort from uh, the cast and, and from pretty much everybody involved. It's another example of a sequel that's too many years too late and tries way too hard to recapture the exact same magic from the original and fails miserably in doing so. Way too much of this film's humor is callbacks to the first movie and references to the first film. And it's like, all right, I get it. The first film's a classic, but if you're not going to put a new spin on it, if you're not really going to put that much of an effort into, into what you're doing with the sequel then why even bother, to be honest? Why even bother wasting the time, the effort, and the money to do another Coming to America film if you're just going to do some half-assed reboot slash homage to the first movie? I mean, you might as well just watch the first film twice. So, the film is directed by uh, Craig Brewer, and I don't think Brewer's direction is the problem. I think he did a decent job here. I don't think it was nearly as impressive of a directing job as his work in Dolomite Is My Name, but I, I still thought it was a well-directed film from a visual standpoint. Uh, there are a lot of different shots in this that are genuinely gorgeous to look at from how they're handled when it comes to the lighting or uh, how uh, Brewer really expands upon and, and enhances the overall um, setting and, and the luxurious nature of the Zamundan uh, production uh, design and art direction when it comes to uh, the look of uh, 
uh, Zamunda. So I do feel that uh, it's a well-directed film. It's not like it's a bad movie when it comes to the directing. I think Craig Brewer was a good choice because he did a remarkable and, and really great job with Dolomite is My Name. But Dolomite is My Name had the benefit of being rated R. And I do feel that this film suffers a lot from the fact that it's a PG-13. The first film was rated R. It had an edge to it. Its humor had a bite. And I think that is something that is sorely lacking with this sequel. It really does come across as too tame. There are times where it seems like it's wanting to go into a raunchier direction, but it's not able to because of the limitations of the PG-13 rating, which I don't even understand why the, the PG-13 rating was there in the first place. Coming to America was an R-rated film and was one of the biggest hits of that year in 1988. Why did this have to be PG-13? R-rated comedies still make a good amount of money if they were planning on this for a theatrical release. Uh, maybe it was an Eddie Murphy decision because he wanted to make a family film. If that's the case, Eddie, you've made enough family movies. You didn't have to turn the Coming to America sequel into another family picture. You've done a million already. So, uh, I don't know who's to blame, but whoever it is... They fucked up because the film is too soft, it's too lukewarm, and the comedy as a result suffers immensely because they're not able to really push boundaries. They're not really able to go very far with the comedy because it's PG-13. One character in particular that is really screwed by this is Wesley Snipes' uh, villain character, General Easy. Uh, General Easy seems like a character that would really benefit from an R rating, and because there's no R rating to be found, he has his balls cut off and is really not able to do that much despite Wesley Snipes' best efforts. Yeah, I just, I don't, that's one of the many issues that I have with this film. The fact that it's PG-13 and tame and not as wild and as uh, brash as the first film. And the screenplay by Kenya Barris, Barry W. Blaustein, and David Sheffield. Another instance of bringing back the original writers to write a sequel numerous years later not working out uh i think it would have been a better idea maybe to bring someone else in on board different voice different concepts different ideas because uh the original writers here they were rusty and they relied far too much on uh callbacks to the first movie and they even got those wrong you know the um the princess that um was initially offered to Akeem in uh, the first film, and uh, Akeem passed on her because she would only do what he wanted to do, and she was so loyal to him that she would embarrass herself and bark like a dog and hop on one la leg and uh, make orangutan sounds. Well, the writers even got their callback to that character wrong in this sequel. They had her continue to bark like a dog. The whole joke is that he never told Akeem never told her to stop barking like a dog, so she's still barking like a dog all these years later. But that's not the joke. When she left the room, she was hopping on one leg and making orangutan sounds. So I'm wondering if it was just an oversight on the writer's part, 
which makes sense because a lot of these comedies written by writers who haven't written films in years tend to be really rusty and don't necessarily remember what happened. And so there's a lot of continuity issues or they didn't have her hopping on one leg and making uh, orangutan sounds because they thought it was racist. They thought it was problematic. I, I think it could be a combination of both. I, I find it kind of uh, ridiculous, though, if they decided not to do it because that was what was going on in the first movie. It was acceptable in the first film, uh, and not very many people had an issue with it. But uh, now it's not, and we have to go with barking like a dog. But regardless, even if they had the right continuity, it still would be a lame callback. It would be like, okay, you're going to bring this actress back only for her to make monkey sounds or to bark like a dog? Well, what a wasted cameo. And yeah, there's a lot of moments in this film when it comes to the script that are just references to the first film. And a lot of the plot is just more of the same as the first movie with very minor differences. And it tries to capture the lightning in the bottle with the barber characters and with Randy Watson and so on and so forth and mcdowell's but it, it just comes across as a pale imitation or a really lazy snl sketch comedy kind of a gag or take on what a coming to america sequel would be and and sketch comedy is a really great way to put this film uh, Craig Brewer's direction is fine, but I do gr agree with other critics where his direction at times does seem like it's just a skit. It doesn't really have a very uh, vibrant or very full or very uh, impactful cinematic uh, look to it. And that's not necessarily entirely Craig Brewer's fault. I think a good reason for that is that there are big chunks of this film that were shot and finished after uh, the pandemic had already uh, started in the United States. So there's a lot of stuff that's shot behind a green screen and looks very flat uh, as a result. So I don't think it's entirely 100% his fault. And I think it would have been interesting to have seen what the film would have looked like visually as a whole if they were able to finish shooting it before the pandemic uh, started to uh, run its course. But yeah, the script has a lot of issues. Its humor, for the most part, is lame, it's tame, uh, and it relies far too much on jokes from the first movie. And the new jokes that it comes up with are not memorable and they're not nearly as funny as the first and a lot of them are lowest common denominator i mean there's a lion farting in this film like really lion farts yeah that's something that the first film was missing lazy bullshit like a lion farting and if that isn't bad enough the whole way that the screenwriters write how Akeem finds out that he has a son is really fucked up. Initially, when I first saw it, I didn't it didn't really register a particular way. But a friend of mine pointed out to me uh, that it is in essence date rape. And then the light bulb clicked on in my head and I was like, damn, that's just messed up, man. And it is. It's date rape. Akeem gets date raped by this random woman in Queens, played by Leslie Jones. And she makes out with him and has sex with him after she drugged him. And... uh 
And that's why he has a son. And that's why he didn't know that he had a son after all these years. And it's a surprise to him because he was date raped by Leslie Jones. Like, wow, what a tone deaf screenplay. Also, this is revealing a disturbing trend with films lately. You got Wonder Woman 1984 with its non-consensual sex with this other guy who uh, his body is being taken over by Steve Trevor. And then you have Date Rape in uh, Coming to America, the sequel. It's like if if this was if the roles were reversed, if this was a female character and a guy got her high and then fucked her and she got pregnant and had a kid, would this be considered to be something as nonchalant as this film makes it out to be? No, there would be tons of outrage, but. For some reason, uh, the screenwriters thought that it was acceptable here. You could come up with a different way to reveal or have Akeem have a son. Or you could just not do that storyline to begin with. You could just do something else. You don't necessarily have to have the whole, oh, Akeem had a son that he didn't know anything about. And now he's got a find him and bring him back to Zamunda because uh, Akeem is now the king because his father passed away and he needs to have an heir. And it's like, okay, all right. But you, you could easily do something else with it. You could figure something else out. You could use your head, be creative. But no, let's, uh, <laughs> let's use date rape. Yeah. It's a great idea. And it's called Coming to America, but there's barely any scenes that take place in America. I would say it, most of the film, about 90% of the movie, if not 95% of the film, takes place in Zamunda. 5%, maybe even less than that, takes place in America. And... The Zamundan scenes are fun at times. Uh, it it does showcase some really nice costume design and production and art direction. But I wanted to see more scenes in America. I wanted to see more scenes where Akeem is back in Queens and and dealing with the culture shock and everything all these years later. But instead... No, we'll, we're just briefly there, and then we're back to Zamunda. And after a while, I just got tired of Zamunda. I got tired of the landscape. I got tired of the storyline that they were going with, with the princely trials and all of this, and the whole deal with uh, Akeem's daughter who wants to be queen and is mad at Akeem and mad at her brother that she just uh, discovered that she had because uh, she trained her whole life to be queen and after a while it just got stale and old and really boring and dull. Uh, that being said, though, speaking of the queen uh, to be uh, the oldest daughter character, um, Mika, Princess Mika, I thought, for the most part, that character was well-written. There were some moments where it was a little heavy-handed and got tiresome in terms of her plot and her storyline. But at the end of the day, I actually felt that this is one of those rare instances of a strong female character that was written properly. Nothing seemed forced with her. You actually did buy that she should be considered to be the ruler, the future ruler of Zamunda. Uh, it didn't seem like it was a forced thing or a forced agenda, at least not to me. It seemed like something that she really would be good at. And that's because the script did, did a good job making her seem like a viable queen and somebody who actually should be in a place of power. 
and uh, a, a definite reason why there should be changes made to the rules and the culture in Zamunda so that she can be able to take uh, control and, and be queen in the future. Uh, unlike a lot of other films that have strong female characters, it doesn't seem like with Princess Mika they wrote her as just a strong independent female character first and then tried to uh, shoehorn certain things or artificially uh, put her on some kind of platform above everybody else. I actually feel there's a lot of things with this character that felt natural. I did believe that she was strong. I did believe that she was a uh, competent leader. And uh, I also felt that the character itself was likable and genuinely badass at times. And I actually thought that she was one of the strongest characters in the film. And there was a emphasis on trying to make her strong, but I feel that it they did it in a way that I think deserves a lot of credit because it did not seem like it was too forced or was too heavy handed, at least for me personally. Uh, there were a couple moments here and there where it was kind of like that, but it there wasn't an overabundance of them. And uh, I think when it comes to heavy handed messages, uh, certain uh, comedy lines and certain jokes or attempts at humor, those were way more heavy handed than anything with this character. In speed of characters, the script seems like it's just a mess and just a jumbled uh, jambalaya of just way too many fucking characters. The first film had a lot of characters, but it seemed like their stories and their uh, subplots were handled better. They were in moderation. They were not all over the place. This feels like it's just a random mishmash of different characters and different subplots. And none of them really have enough time to breathe. So after a while, this incessant, just constant flow of characters and storylines and tired gags suffocates the film in the end. And I do think that's a screenwriting issue. I really do. Cut out some of these characters. Why did Akeem need to have three daughters? Why can't we just have him have one daughter or two? Why do we need to have three of them? Why do we... If we're going to have this whole thing with a General Izzy... Maybe you just need to focus more on that. And not as much on this stuff with uh, uh, Akeem's son. And Tracy Morgan. And, and Leslie Jones. And all of this other stuff. And... It just seemed like a lot, and I feel that it really was to the detriment of the film in the end, because it seemed like a lot of the, the cast members that you wanted to see, you didn't get as many scenes featuring them as you would have liked. Eddie didn't really have that much to do, even though he was on camera a good amount of time, a lot of it was just... Him standing there, smiling, laughing, or saying a line or two, and then delegating the rest of the film to these other characters. Uh, the biggest chunk of characterization and plot line goes to Lavelle. It goes to Jermaine Fowler. And I thought Jermaine Fowler did a good job with the performance, but the character was bland. And quite boring and just felt like a poor man's dollar tree version of a prince akeem really at the end of the day they tried to make him more distinguished in terms of his style in terms of how he carries himself but then never really did enough to really make it seem like it was a a strong characterization or a strong character. And I also felt like the conflict that was going on here was very confusing. It was something about, okay, 
General Izzy wants to uh, start a war with Zamunda, but he'll put it on on the side if uh, Akeem's son Lavelle marries his uh, daughter. So if if Lavelle does, agrees to marry uh, Izzy's daughter, then they'll make peace and not war. And, of course, Lavelle doesn't want that. He falls in love with this hairdresser. Uh, and this causes strife to happen. And, and then it just felt like by the end of the film, when uh, when uh, Izzy is defeated by uh, the, Akeem's daughters, it just seemed like that's there for an action sequence to break up the monotony of the plot and then also just to end Izzy's storyline and it just seemed like an afterthought I was like oh I, I he's this ruthless warlord and he will just agree to change his mind because he got his ass kicked it's kind of like okay like is this really the first time he's ever lost a battle is this the first time he's ever gotten his butt handed to him does he quit every single time that happens um It just made the character of General Izzy appear to be incredibly weak in the end. It just seemed like a guy who is just a glorified bully. Oh, if you stand up to him, he'll uh, back off. So yeah, there really wasn't much of a conflict. I mean, there's this conflict about who's going to ascend to the throne. And will it be Mika or will it be Lavelle? And... It predictably ends the way you think it will, with Mika getting the nod and Lavelle uh, finding some other way to uh, help Zamunda. And there's also the third act fallout where Lavelle runs away and goes to America, takes his girlfriend with him and doesn't want to be a part of the kingdom because he heard something that was a lie. I'm so tired of that fucking stale-ass storyline. And that's another thing that just seems like more of the same for the first film. The whole like, oh my god, you lied! And then, instead of Akeem having to go to get, uh, to convince his uh, wife-to-be and Lisa to come back to Zamunda with him, this time around, it's his son. He has to convince his son to come back to Zamunda. It's the same fucking thing, though. So, yeah, I mean, I, I know I've spent a lot of time talking about the script and the story, and it doesn't seem like there's much there, and there isn't. I mean, there's a lot of scenes in this movie that are just straight-up edits from the first film. There's, there's not one but two moments in this film that are just narration and recaps of what happened in the first movie. You know you have a lazy, tired retread of a sequel when you have multiple moments like that in the story and in the screenplay where you have oh hey remember that date scene or oh, hey remember that how funny that was i'm like yeah i do uh showing it to me just makes me want to watch the first film again and stop watching this movie so it's not really having the intended effect that I think you want it to. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the heavy-handed, forced, progressive uh, SJW attempts at humor and jokes. Like, you have really awkward moments where the barbershop guys are talking about how you can't touch women by their breasts anymore and that's assault and i get it I, I i understand uh that it's wrong and i do believe that it is wrong and it should not have been considered acceptable in the past and definitely shouldn't be considered acceptable today but references like that with the barbershop characters is forced it doesn't come across as natural. It comes across as it's some kind of forced agenda. And 
it's also not funny. It breaks up whatever attempt that the scene is trying to have in terms of its comedy, because then it just stops for the film to get up on a soapbox and say that sexual assault is wrong. It is. I know it is. Everybody knows that it's wrong. We don't need coming to America to tell us how wrong sexual assault is. Um... And we also don't need coming to America to tell us how sexist the preacher character is. That's not something that we really needed to see and we really need to know. And it comes across as unbelievably forced, as if they're shoving it down your throat. And I'm not a fan of this kind of writing. It's not natural. It's not something that flows well within the film and every single time that a film does this the film stops in its tracks and really uh goes down quite a few notches in terms of the overall quality because it's got to stop to throw this agenda in your face and it's like i didn't ask for this and you know what there's a time and place for that. And I don't feel that this film is the time and place for this kind of uh, agenda pushing. I really don't. So yeah, I mean, such a disappointment when it comes to the storyline and the characterization and, and how things were written and, and, and the comedy and just, uh, I mean... It's 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 a film that really doesn't do much to justify its existence. It's like, why? Why was this made? Oh, so characters and uh, certain uh, writers and directors and people who were involved with the first movie could have a little reunion. It's like, you could just re do a reunion and do an interview together and talk about coming to America and what it was like shooting a film and all this other stuff. You could just shoot the shit and talk about the first movie if you want to have a reunion. You don't have to make a really shallow reunion movie disguised as a sequel if that's what you're looking for and that's what you want to do. And yeah, I mean... Part of me really did enjoy seeing Eddie back again as Prince Akeem and Orsinio Hall as Semi and Sherry Headley as Lisa. I, I will say this performance wise, this film doesn't really feature acting that really is that awful, except for some of the supporting characters. I mean, Eddie Murphy's performance isn't bad. He's just given really not a whole lot to work with. The PG-13 rating really uh, castrates him in terms of what he can do comedically. And the character spends most of the movie being an unlikable prick. So that doesn't help either. Or he's all headstrong and stubborn about the ideals of his father and of Zamunda and loses track of things and as a result it fractures the relationship with his wife and his family and it's just like or whatever um Arsenio Hall was barely even in the movie uh the scenes that he has are fun but he's barely in the film uh Jermaine Fowler like I said his performance is fine I didn't mind the the acting by Jermaine Fowler but the character was very bland and just didn't really give a fuck Leslie Jones I actually thought her character Mary delivered some of the film's rare moments that made me chuckle and I think Leslie Jones is better suited for supporting role work instead of a lead role uh, I don't think she's a good enough actress or a good enough comedian to be a lead in a comedy and I think her shtick and her overall uh, take on comedy is, is much more effective in small doses. Tracy Morgan, I think is another instance like that. He's here as Reem, but I honestly didn't like his character. I thought his character was, a, was really obnoxious. 
and uh, unfunny. Wesley Snipes, he tried, but the character was given nothing to do but dance like a goofball and act like he's intimidating, but then he just gets his ass kicked by three girls and then is all like, oh, I quit. You win. James Earl Jones. It was depressing to see him in this. And not because he delivered a bad performance, but because he's definitely showing his age and it was honestly really sad to see him tired and just not really having a lot of energy and I, I honestly wish they didn't have him in the film as much as they did I don't, and and not because James Earl Jones is a, a bad actor or or that the character of King Joffy is is an issue but I, I just think I really feel that they should have had just a few scenes or maybe just one or two and just left it at that instead of this really uncomfortable scene where he's having a funeral while he's alive and Morgan Freeman is doing narration and he's talking about how when uh Prince uh when uh, King uh Joffy died nobody had sex it's uh, the the joke is really bad I'm sorry. It was a really bad joke. John Amos, he just does the same thing where he's talking about all of his uh, McDowell's products that are very close to McDonald's products. Even makes a reference to the McFlurry. Louis Anderson. It doesn't even seem like he got his management position. He's still a mid-level employee. Like, what, what, what a missed opportunity. He should have been at least a fry cook. Um, and you, you have other actors and actresses. I mean, you got Kiki Lane who plays Mika. I, I thought she delivered one of the best performances in the film, to be honest. Uh, and... You got Tiana Taylor who plays uh, General Izzy's daughter, um, Bella Murphy who plays Oma, uh, Aklu Love who plays Tanashi. Uh, you also had Clint Smith who returned as uh, Sweets the barber. Trevor Noah as a cameo is this Amunda News Network anchor, and it's a CNN parody, and th that whole bit was pure cringe did not laugh one bit i don't know what they were going for with that it did not work colin jost fucking colin jost again he's in this as the son of uh the uh trading places uh rich guy characters who lost their fortune and then started their business again because Akeem decided to give them some money and coming to America. So yeah, they make that reference again. Cause yeah, that was necessary. Uh, he plays Mr. Duke and he's just as big of a prick as his, his uh, grandparents are. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's actually his father. None of those are like his father. There's his grandparents, my bad, but there was like a random cameo of Dikembe Matumbo, the basketball player. I was like, hey, there's Dikembe. And then it was like, okay, bye Dikembe. Uh, and then he had a lot of well-known singers from the past and the present who showed up in cameos. You got Salt and Pepper, uh, or Salt and Peppa, sorry. You got uh, Gladys Knight, and they all sang covers of their songs that were meant to be tributes to King Joffy, and it was just kind of like, eh, whatever. Uh, Rick Ross is in this because uh, John Legend voices um, uh, uh, Paul Bates's um, song when he sings uh, She's Your Queen to Be. This time around, it's John Legend, and uh, during the mid credits, he sings uh while he's playing the piano there is a remix of uh the systems coming to america song uh that's featured here with a little more rap and hip-hop uh the score by jermaine stegall 
nowhere near as memorable or as iconic as the work by Niles Rogers. Uh, cinematography by Joe Williams. It's fine. The film does look good at times. Uh, the editing by David S. Clark and Billy Fox. It's a little wonky. Sometimes it, it, it's a little bit too frenetic for my tastes. Um, and from a technical standpoint, there are there are other things about it that really don't work that well. Uh, for instance, you have really bad CGI. So you have these scenes where you can clearly tell that these actors are not on location and that's distracting and I understand why they had to do it that way but it's still a distraction nonetheless and then you have stuff like uh, these really bad CGI lions and this that doesn't do anything to help the film when it comes to its mood or its atmosphere um, and it's like 110 minutes it's actually shorter than the first film but it has worse pacing because the concept of the plot isn't nearly as intriguing or as interesting or as entertaining as the first film the love story with uh, prince akim's son and the hairdresser it's sweet but it's still really bland and fairly one note and it's just a pretty dull affair. There's a sequence in this film to me that perfectly sums up how disappointing and ultimately how poor this sequel is. Akeem is in the doghouse with his wife Lisa because he's too stubborn when it comes to maintaining tradition and he doesn't want to budge. So, she doesn't want to have anything to do with him. She doesn't want to sleep with him. And so, he just rolls over away from her and mutters under his breath, This is bullshit. And... Truer words have never been spoken when it comes to this sequel. Coming to America is bullshit. <laughs>